Baldes. This meeting um, is being recorded. From Paris. Um, and Yaso did his PhD at the University of Melbourne together with Ray Volkast and Nicole Bell. Um, and after that, he moved on as postdoc for, uh, to Desi, first to Desi, then to Brussels, um, and now he's in Paris. Yasson is an expert on dark matter physics and astroparticle physics in general, and today he will be telling us about primordial black holes as dark matter, interferometric tests of phase transition origin. So please, Yasson, over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, um, Michel, and uh, thanks for letting me present these, uh, these results here. So this is uh, work I did with uh, Maria Olaya Olaya Romancho. And um, it's really uh, motivated, of course, by the, let's say, the missing mass problem. So um, a priori, you might wonder, you know, if, we, if the solution is additional uh, matter content or some uh, modified gravity. But uh, it seems to um, uh, be uh, uh, that uh, adding uh, additional matter content uh, seems to be easier in terms of an overall uh, coherent picture, in terms of also explaining uh, not only uh, galaxy rotation curves, but also um, uh, uh, velocities of galaxies and clusters and, and C and B and, and the matter power spectrum. So then uh, uh, have, making this uh, assumption that uh, we should have some dark matter, there are various possibilities such as uh, um, Elementary particles um, include, uh, say, the axion or axion-like particle in that category. Some, uh, maybe some solitonic structure, or um, what's become a, a, a hot topic again recently is uh, uh, primordial black holes. So um, the interesting, very interesting window for uh, having primordial black holes as as dark matter is in this so-called so uh, asteroid. Uh, mass region uh, with about where the uh, primordial black holes would have a mass between about uh, 10 to the minus 16 or 10 to the minus 10 solar masses. And this allows for all the dark matter to be in a quite deep spectrum um, and, and, and be, be made of all the dark matter be uh, primordial black holes in this, in this window. So it's constrained from uh, above here by uh, um, lensing uh, here, the constraints from uh, uh, hyper subprime cam from the Super Rove telescope and uh, from uh, micro lensing events, and uh, from, uh, constrained from below by uh, the Hawking evaporation of the primordial black holes, which would uh, lead to extra galactic background light or additional e, e plus, e minus pairs, which, uh, or uh, positrons, let's say, which can be picked up by, uh, say, uh, the Voyager spacecraft. Those are the sort of uh, most stringent constraints. So uh, given that, this is uh, sort of the area we really want to, say, target in, in trying to you know, explain what dark matter is, okay? And uh, uh, primordial black hole production in the early universe has been uh, uh, looked at in you know, a number of different scenarios. The most popular one is the, um, creating some uh, over-densities during inflation. So these would then... Um, uh, be on, on scales much smaller than the, than the C and B um, uh, fluctuations we've observed. And, uh, but they would, in the very early universe, they would be, you know, produced during inflation, be super horizon size. And then when this, uh, this over-density re-enters the Hubble horizon, it would uh, collapse into uh, primordial black holes, as long as the over-density is, is large enough, okay? In terms of the fluctuation over the, over the background, uh, density, okay? Uh, then there are more uh, convoluted uh, um, or more involved processes such as the possibility of uh, phase transitions occurring at the end of inflation, um, early universe uh, dissipative processes perhaps <coughs> in the matter-dominated re regime, say. And also um, what we're going to focus, going to look at here is uh, phase transitions starting from a radiation-dominated epoch. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Why phase transition at the end of it? Yeah, there's some um, uh, models which uh, basically link uh, some phase transition dynamics. But it doesn't ne necessarily happen at the end. Uh, uh, sorry? It's necessarily happened to uh, the so, end. Okay, I, should, uh, I didn't put the references, but there are some models which are closely linked to uh, having some sort of feature at the, at the end of inflation. Yeah. 
Um, so, but uh, so it, it, obviously the, the the second point here and the last one are, are, are sort of uh, conceptually linked. But here we're going to start in radiation domination and. and So, um, okay, so uh, the inspiration really, okay, is uh, and probably um, many people are very familiar with this, but uh, let's say uh, you look at the standard model Higgs potential, and interestingly enough, okay, we've known the VEF for a long time, and uh, since the LHC measurements, we've, we've known the mass, and this really fixes all the parameters of the potential, and um, we don't really know what's, what's going on away from the... Um, broken phase minimum here in which uh, we're, we're sitting. But if you just assume the standard model, this is, this is uh, everything is fixed. And what's amazing, of course, is that at high temperature, this is also been known for a long time, is that and typically, you know, in, in cosmological scenarios, we're going to be at very high temperatures above, temperatures above the electroweak phase transition in the, in the early universe, about, above the electroweak scale. And there, actually, um, the... The minimum of the effective potential um, means that the, the um, Higgs VEV would uh, sit, at, sit at zero. And then as the temperature dropped, you would uh, transition into the, into the broken phase. Okay? And the leading um, effects can be um, captured by having this, by introducing this thermal mass coefficient um, called the Higgs boson. So this thermal mass term, which has a positive sign, which um, um, counteracts the negative sign, which would uh, lead to symmetry breaking. Okay, and the um, coefficient depends on the couplings to other standard model particles, which then uh, gain their mass during the um, when the Higgs gets gets a VEV. So at high temperature, you have this uh, thermal buff of particles, and it becomes energetically favorable for their masses to be um, um, zero and the Higgs VEV to be be at zero. Okay. Now, um, what's interesting, of course, is uh, that uh, this not only is the symmetry restored at high temperature, but if you just take this, you know, vanilla scenario, let's say, then uh, the the vacuum energy in the in the early universe was much much larger than it is, is today. Right. So um, even though in in the in the typical okay um, um, scenario, this this vacuum energy density never really plays a, a role in cosmology because it's you always have a larger, much larger radiation bath energy density present. So the evolution of the universe doesn't really see it. But it's sort of, it's very interesting and of course linked also to the cosmological constant problem, you know, that you could actually, you know, our universe in, in, in the standard uh, scenarios, say, would have been at a much larger vacuum energy density in, 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 the, in the early universe, right? Um, before we transition here where uh, by some chance or whatever, um, the vacuum energy density is, is small. Okay, so taking this as inspiration, we're going to look at uh, exotic phase transitions. So in the standard model, it's still an open question, you know, uh, whether there's some new physics that makes the standard model a first order phase transition rather than a, a crossover transition, which is, uh, um, well, that makes the um, electroweak phase transition a, a first order phase transition or rather than the uh, crossover transition, which is in, there in the standard model in the at the, at the physical uh, parameter point. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you have a, instead of having this uh, crossover transition, if you have a first order transition, you have a barrier and the effective potential between the broken phase, uh, sorry, the symmetric phase and the, and the broken phase minima, and then the um, transition occurs through either um, thermal excitations over the barrier or through uh, via quantum tunneling uh, through the barrier. So this uh, transition then occurs via bubble nucleation and um, you have uh, then bubbles of true vacuum nucleating out of the um, false vacuum. And these bubbles expand and create out of equilibrium conditions. And then when they collide, can produce uh, gravitational waves. Yeah. And this has been a focus on a lot of research, not only the electroweak phase transitions, but exotic phase transitions um, with uh, new, new scalar degrees of freedom, which is going to be the, the topic uh, today. So in a supercooled phase transition, which we're going to be interested in, we're going to begin in radiation domination, and we're going to be in the symmetric phase. And then um, the temp the, the, we're going to be interested in a, in a first order phase transition. So we have a barrier between the symmetric and broken phase minima, and the scalar field will become stuck in this uh, symmetric phase 
long enough so that uh, the universe um, enters a vacuum dominated regime where the energy density and radiation, which scales as the temperature to the fourth power, becomes subdominant to the large uh, uh, vacuum energy or large cosmological constant at the um, symmetric uh, point. Okay. And uh, but this uh, barrier will then continue evolving with temperature, and um, this will uh, uh, let us avoid the graceful exit problem. So basically, the bubble nucleation rate will become rapid enough so that the phase transition can actually complete. Okay, And then we, we have this uh, picture where the vacuum energy density um, uh, pushes the bubble walls of the, of the um, interface between the uh, symmetric and broken phases where the field is, is somewhere between, you know, interpolating between these two uh, minima. And these bubble walls that accelerate and, and collide, eventually reheating the universe. So you have a picture where the, um, all the vacuum energy density essentially goes into the bubble walls. And then when these bubble walls uh, collide, you have some um, crazy oscillations of the scalar field, which then decay back into radiation. And as long as the phase transition is, is strong enough, you also have the possibility of a primordial black hole production. Okay. So now in the next, um, in the next couple of slides, I'll just uh, give a brief overview of this uh, mechanism for primordial black hole production, and then I'll explain in a bit more detail uh, later on. Yeah. So the, this is uh, the so-called late patch mechanism for primordial black hole production, and it was uh, uh, sort of uh, repopularized uh, recently in, in paper up here. So the, the picture is the following. So that in, in the average Hubble patch, we have some uh, bubbles appearing when the bubble nucleation rate, the unit volume appro appro approaches the Hubble scale. Okay? But some rare patches just by uh, uh, chance, they don't, the, the first bubbles appear in the light rare patch a bit later on. Yeah? So um, this is so-called uh, the late nucleation. Okay. And these, the, the transition from in these late patches from the vacuum dominated regime back into the radiation dominated regime occurs somewhat later because of this. And now when the average background patch has transitioned back into radiation, the energy density is getting redshifted like this one on the scale factor of the fourth power. While the um, late patch is still stuck a bit in vacuum domination where the vacuum energy, the rate, the density is not being uh, redshifted. Okay. So then uh, these late patches will then have an overdensity once they've converted back into radiation yeah, compared to the average background radiation around them. And through this, we have, you know, you have some curvature perturbation, which then can collapse into a, a primordial black hole. Okay. Now, um, a quick question. So when you say significant, I mean, so these patches have to be, these patches are quite rare, right? Yes, exactly. exactly. So when you say significant, meaning the number of such patches collapsing into... Yeah. So the definition, patches. yeah, yeah, very good question. So that... Because it's, it goes like Hubble to the four, right? And so so these patches have to be really rare. Um, so because gamma goes like H to the four, yeah. so the number of such patches will be very rare. And then, so yes. when you say significant, you mean given that Hubble patch, the number of such objects collapsing at us? So the definition of significant here is simply that the probability is such that you end up with FPBH, like the, the, fraction, the yeah. fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes to be order one. Wow, yeah, okay. Today, yeah. So the, the typical probability when you're in this asteroid mass gap, I think is like something like 10 to the minus 15 or 10 to the minus 20, something like this. Yeah. yeah? So the each patch is that, that you that you delay the nucleation long enough is very, it's a very low probability. Yeah. Yeah. Because you need to keep like a, actually a somewhat larger volume than Hubble, bubble free, while the bubble nucleation rate is caught up to the Hubble expansion rate. Yeah. Okay. So it turns out that um, uh, quantitatively, um, what you need is that the, um, Basically, this, this parameter beta here is used in a lot of the phase transition literature. And what it, what it is, it's just the inverse time scale of the, of the phase transition. Okay? So basically what you need is that the inverse time scale of the phase transition is about eight times the Hubble rate. Okay? So in other words, let's say back of the envelope, you, you imagine that the phase transition takes about 
let's say, uh, a 10 percent of the Hubble time to complete. Yeah? Okay. This is the sort of uh, uh, back of the envelope uh, rule here. Yeah? Um, and I'll show the calculation later on. Yeah? So and what's interesting then is that, okay, the, the mass, the PBH mass is related to the, like in the, also like in the inflationary scenario, the, the final PBH mass is, is related to the mass inside the Hubble horizon at the time when this thing is collapsing. Yeah? And this um, scales as uh, here at the bottom of the slide, M Planck cubed over the um, reheating temperature squared. Where I'm, I'm linking the, the vacuum energy density, which is setting the Hubble scale to the reheating temperature. Okay, so this is just a tilde here. Yeah? So it turns out, and I'm assuming that this vacuum energy density goes rapidly back into a thermal bath, which sets the reheating temperature. So another yeah. question. So yeah. the only thing that you need here, so you don't need any, I don't see any need for any new phys at, at least all that it depends on is the inflationary dynamics and nothing else. At yeah, least you, you need the new physics to get give you this super strong phase transition. Sure, but once you know that, I mean, all yeah. you all you ask all you're asking for is a reheating temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very generic. Yeah. So, so, so to clear, what, what would you refer here? The reheat temperature. The reheat temperature of the inflation, or no, the, the reheating. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Second phase, the yeah. phase transition. Very good question. Yeah, the second yeah. phase transition. The reheating temperature following the phase transition, rather than the reheating temperature following uh, slow roll. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine you have the, the standard reheat yeah. temperature, which is after say slow roll inflation. So th whatever. this is essentially the and the late heat, which is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is essentially the latent. So to get into this into this window, you need this reheating temperature to be between about 10 and 10,000 teraelectrons. Okay. And uh, this links nicely to the um, gravitational wave production. Okay. So the gravitational wave production from uh, bubble collisions scales as, as I showed here. It goes as uh, one over the bubble size of Circulation squared, okay, and the bubble size of percolation is related to this um, um, inverse time scale of the phase transition. So, yeah. and basically, if you need this, you know, beta to be eight times h, so you're going to end up with a, a, a relatively strong signal compared to you know future projections of <coughs> sensitivity curves of, of, of gravitational wave interferometers. And the the peak frequency is related to the um, typical bubble size. At the phase transition, of course, with a redshifting factor, yeah? And so it, it scales like this, as I've written here. And then for these sort of um, scales, uh, um, 10 to 10,000 TeV, you're going to have a peak frequency of your signal, which is going to be um, um, uh, in, in the frequency bands of LISA, uh, beta SIGO, and Einstein telescope, depending on the scale of the, of the phase transition. So it's a very promising scenario, okay? And it was already sort of pointed out and, and, and known, but uh, we, we provide some additional uh, details in our calculation, which I'll, I'll talk about um, um, below. So basically this uh, PBH window is, uh, um, is, an, is can, be, can be tested um, in a way indirectly through the gravitational waves, okay? And I should point out that in the standard inflationary scenario, okay, you also need the over densities to have this, um, the typical Hubble, same typical Hubble scales, right, to, en to enter yeah. this window. And therefore, and there you also produce gravitational waves through the um, at second order in perturbation theory um, um, because of the anisotropic stress in, in subcritical patches. Yeah? So this is, this is why the frequencies are, are the same for the bubble collisions here, the typical frequency and the, and the, um, in the inflationary scenario, the standard inflationary scenario for this testing this sort of uh, PBH production. Okay? It's just all related to the Hubble scale. That you the mass of PBH is yeah. d, d squared over what is it? Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's like this. Yeah, I mean, there's some factor at the front which I've suppressed. Yeah. So now let's say we discover gravitational signature. Yeah. Um, then what you would need to kind of link it to PBH production would just be extracting the index beta from the from let's say the peak value or the slope. And yes. That would, if it's large enough, then that would be a, yeah, a strong hint. Let's say that yeah. they would typically produce. Uh, yeah. PBH. So if you see a large peak in this sort of frequency range, like you say, it would be a strong 
indirect uh, hint for, for uh, primordial black hole production. Now, the uncertainty is still in the predictions of the gravitational wave spectrum are still large, yeah? So, and it's, yeah, experimentally, it's also difficult to very precisely maybe pull out the you know, gravitational wave spectrum with the first gener you know, the, the first generation of detectors which sees a, a background. Yeah? But there is the one to one mapping, right? Let's say if beta is large enough, then it's kind of automatically I would need associated PBH production, or you know, I can always design a scenario where you can, okay, yeah. This is this is a good question. If beta see the the, the PBH production is sort of exponentially sensitive to beta. So if your beta is slightly lower than required, you would essentially see the same gravitational waves, but your FPBH would be lower, right? So you'd need some other method of, of, of confirming, right? But okay, if you see this huge uh, gravitational wave signal, this is one of the scenarios that could be uh, creating it. Yeah, so yeah, but like I was just wondering, like, so you Beta can also be larger than H, and then it would even, I mean, it would just overproduce. No, no, yeah, it, it goes inversely. So if you go to smaller beta, the, oh, yeah, 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 it's the inverse time scale. So if you go to a smaller beta, then you produce more. Yeah, yeah, so if, produce more. yeah if, if beta is too small, then you could potentially overproduce uh, primordial black holes. But there's, as I'll discuss, discuss later, there's also uncertainty in the, in the collapse threshold in these. Not only in the inflationary scenario, there's uncertainty in the collapse, you know, how to quantify the collapse, but also in the, much more uncertainty in these phase transition scenarios. So if you, let's say you reconstructed a gravitational wave signal and you find that uh, beta is uh, six times Hubble, right? And you say, okay, why, do, why aren't I seeing primordial black holes? It might just be that the collapse threshold is a bit uh, more stringent than you first assumed. Okay. So these are the asteroid masses. Yes, asteroid mass. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So these these are the asteroid size mass. So you have six, roughly six, or being generous, six orders of magnitude in the mass of allowed, and that translates into three orders of magnitude in the reheating temperature for this window. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to discuss a, a detailed model which could uh, serve as an example to um, giving you such a phase transition. Okay. Um, but it, like I like you uh, alluded to before, it's sort of generic, right? So other, yeah, other... I mean, if you're using Coleman Weinberg, then yeah. as generic as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the the key assumptions, though, you know, it's the, the final signal is going to be generic in a way for the gravitational waves. But the key assumption is that um, that the reheating um, occurs efficiently following the phase transition. So, but the reheating temperature, does it depend on the specifics of your model? Or, I, I mean, I guess I can still read it off from the Coleman Weinberg parameters or something. Yeah, okay. It depends on, well, I've got a slide later. It depends on the decay rate of the, the field That's driving right. the phase transition. So, if the this decay rate is very low, you can imagine that you get stuck into a, in a matter dominated epoch after the phase transition. So, the field will just oscillate. That's it around the minimum of its potential rather than decaying into particles. Yeah. And then you have a, a, perhaps a collapse into primordial black holes during matter domination rather than radiation domination, but so there's no pressure there. So the collapse occurs more efficiently, but you also, and you also redshift more the gravitational wave signal. Okay. So here, this is just a very simple example. Okay, you add the three right-handed neutrinos to cancel off the uh, anomalies. You gauge the B minus L um, symmetry, and you uh, um, have a scalar here, rho, with a charge minus two, which uh, breaks the symmetry. And to get the very strong phase transition, we're interested in these uh, classically scale invariant potentials, where there's no uh, mass term in, in, the, in the potential. And then, um, you have this uh, quartic coupling here, lambda, which would be positive at very high scales. And then the RGE flow means that eventually it hits zero and turns negative, um, um, signaling uh, the radiative symmetry breaking. Okay? And the simplest way to analyze this, sort of the, the simplest way, is just um, that you have this uh, um, potential, which uh, has this logarithmic uh, term here. and uh, Basically, the, the quartic, um, the beta function uh, effectively uh, controls here this uh, quartic um, near the near the minimum of the potential. Okay, and of course, at the, in the in the symmetric phase, 
we have to have some uh, vacuum energy um, um, to, 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 to explain why the, the vacuum energy today is, is, uh, is close to zero, okay? So um, this is basically, this uh, lambda vac is like basically the vacuum energy difference which will drive our phase transition. So is that, is that you're adding by, by hand? Um, essentially, yeah, yeah, in these, in these um, models, yeah. And also the Planck uh, scale is uh, not... Uh, because there is the load to the you form. can do it other way. I mean, okay. uh, there is a super trace formula which you can tune the parameters of the zero. Okay, to maybe not zero. Okay. In that case, of course, there is no uh, that kind of vacuum energy. Okay, but I mean, in that case, you still have a I mean a vacuum energy difference between the symmetric and broken phase. Well, it's it's almost zero. It's almost zero. Yeah, right? they're degenerate. They're degenerate. Okay. Yeah. Here, this is going to be small, yeah, because it depends on the beta function, which in the end is. Well, well, anyway, you, you need to have that uh, high enough, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The difference. Yeah, yeah. So it has to depend on four or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, so V rho is something that you just. V rho is a free parameter. It's just the bed of the, where the B minus L symmetry is broken. Yeah. So we're going to have, yeah, V rho, the parameters are going to be V rho. Uh, G, B minus L, the gauge coupling, and then I typically fix the Yukawa couplings to the right-handed neutrinos to be small. Okay. okay, very good. Okay, so then um, we just did the simplest thing because it hasn't, hasn't been looked at in terms of PDH production for this sort of model. So um, we have a one-loop analysis where we have the thermal corrections, which uh, um, tell you how, you know, uh, the, the, the contributions from the Z prime, the gauge boson, and the, and the um, uh, right-handed neutrinos to the effective potential. And then um, you have this daisy correction, which uh, uh, tends to, uh, because of the finite thermal mass of the, of the longitudinal degree of freedom for the Z prime, this, this tends to make the transition slightly weaker. So this should be included, okay? Um, okay. So very good. So this is just the simplest sort of analysis you could do. In the future, one could do more sophisticated uh, an analysis of the effective potential. Okay, so then um, but this very simple model gives us exactly what we need, okay? So you have this at high temperature, we're in this uh, symmetric phase, and then as the temperature drops, we have this barrier because of the contribution of the gauge bosons to the effective potential. And um, basically, um, and you can calculate numerically the, the bubble nucleation rate. Um, for the people who are familiar with this, I just give you the formula at the, at the bottom. And basically, it's uh, in our case, it's going to be dominated by the um, thermal fluctuation of the barrier, so the O3 symmetric uh, um, um, bounce, which is here, the action is uh, denoted by S3. Okay? So how heavy is the Z prime? The Z prime will be uh, typically... Yeah, roughly the scale of the reheating temperature. Oh, I see. So yeah. in the range of a few tens of kV. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, in the, in the, unfortunately, in this, if you want to hit the PBH, if you want to hit the dark matter mass gap, yeah, like the, the asteroid masses, this puts your Z prime beyond collider reach. Yeah? The lightest Z prime is, I forgot what it was, like, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a bit above collider reach, yeah. Yeah, I guess because your reheating temperature is above 10 TeV, yeah. all your scales are above yeah. 10 TeV, yeah, okay. so your V rho is roughly 100 TeV. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so. Well, why is that only is it that, that the, all of those three symmetric dominates? Is that, is that because of the parameters? Or yeah, it's because of the parameters, yeah. You can go to close to conformal potentials. If the supercooling is long enough, then eventually the, the O4 symmetric bounce uh, starts dominating. So the, the bubble, in other words, I mean, if you when when you have the O3 symmetric bounce, it's because of the um, periodicity in the in the time coordinate, and and basically. No, no, I yeah, understand, yeah, yeah. but usually when you have a you know that depends of course on the, the yeah. details of the potential, but yeah. usually they you know this uh, scale invariant things gives you only part of type of solution of four uh, bounce solutions, uh, and if you're trapped. Very long time in the in the origin. Yes. So, yeah, I would have naively thought that the, that would dominate, but it depends. Yeah, on yeah, the, you're exactly right. Eventually, it does dominate, but here it's still the O3. Yeah, we checked uh, numerically. Yeah, and the and the bubble size is typically 
when it when it nucleates, the bubble size is typically like I don't know, like uh, ten times the one on ten over the temperature, or something like this. So it makes sense. Okay. So now um, um, looking at the, okay, so you have two effects here driving the strength of the phase transition. One is uh, the uh, gauge boson thermal mass, which uh, gives you the barrier and the potential, which obviously increases as you increase the gauge coupling. And the second of all is that when you, um, when you uh, decrease, let's say, when you um, decrease the, the, the gauge coupling, you make the two um, phases the minima are more and more degenerate because the vacuum energy depends on the beta function, which is then being decreased, okay? And in the end, the, the, when the second effect sort of quantitatively wins out. So when you, when you decrease the gauge coupling here, you make the transition, the phase transition stronger and stronger, okay? So to get um, to a vacuum dominated uh, regime before the phase transition uh, occurs, you typically, here we're interested in gauge couplings below about 0.4 or something like this yeah, for these parameters. Uh, okay, and here you see on the left, okay, here the critical temperature, it depends a little bit on the, on the um, gauge coupling, the temperature at which inflation starts, the second line here, and then you see here in um, the lines which then drop very steeply for small gauge couplings, this is the nucleation and temperature when the first bubble appears and the percolation temperature when the, when the bubble bubbles meet and, and the phase transition completes. Okay. So, um, okay, so then uh, having said that, now we're interested in calculating the, the over densities created. So first of all, we solve the Friedman equations for the background patch, okay? And um, uh, basically, the, um, the, because, because your bubble nucleation rate typically calculated in terms of the um, temperature rather than the time. Yeah? So it's uh, useful to, to change coordinate and go into a, a for bookkeeping to, to introduce uh, the false vacuum temperature here. Yeah? And H without any subscript is the false vacuum Hubble rate. So you can just uh, rewrite the second equation. And, that, and um, then we do the same thing for the late patch here. You're gonna have a different Hubble because the, it's gonna stay in vacuum domination slightly longer. Um, and basically, the again, the, the evolution here for the, for the late patch, it's going to depend on your, your initial condition, which is when you uh, assume the, the first bubble appears, which is uh, denoted by Ti for initial. Yeah? When the, okay, so this is going to be later than the first bubble appears in the average background patch. Okay, so then you solve the equations. Um, this is, this is a plot on the left showing that. So in blue, we have the radiation, the density. In green, the total density. And in yellow, the vacuum energy density. And you see here, um, the back, for the background patch, it's the um, dashed line. And for the late patch, it's the um, solid line here, chosen for a certain T initial of about uh, 10, 20, about uh, 45 uh, GeV or so, okay? Um, and you see here, uh, Already on this plot, when I start this plot on the right, we're already in the vacuum domination, okay? And eventually um, the uh, bubbles start nucleating. You see in this background patch, you start off with the possibility of very rare bubbles, but then later on, a lot of bubbles appear, the vacuum energy density really drops down and you transition back into, into radiation, okay? So you start off with the vacuum domination, yeah, and yeah. then you transition to... Yeah, just on this plot. So, so when you're solving the Friedman equation, yeah. what are you assuming? You're assuming vacuum domination it, from the start? It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the overall picture is that you that you start in the radiation domination. Okay. Yeah, but on this plot, just to uh, allow for space, I you see. start off here. Yeah. So it, it just it doesn't matter exactly where you start, as long as the bubble nucleation rate is, is small enough when you start the computation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then you um, solve, uh, okay, and on the right here it shows a typical uh, contrast density. So this is just a rho rad over the background value minus one. And you see here um, at the very high temperatures they're the same radiation density. And then um, basically uh, you have, you start transitioning in the background patch. So the delta drops down to minus one and eventually um, delta shoots up because the background patch, both have transitioned, but the background patch has redshifted more, okay? So then eventually you reach a peak uh, delta and then it drops again. <coughs> okay. 
So you basically solve this, um, you know, look at, uh, choose different initial temperatures for your first bubble in the late patch, and then you find a function um, here, I show here, the delta max, the maximum in this uh, contrast density as a function of the initial temperature for the, for the late patch uh, nucleation, okay? Now, um, typically, okay, one, one assumes that uh, when, um, when uh, delta max reaches some high enough value, that you're going to hit a threshold and, and form a primordial black hole, okay? So basically, if delta is one, then basically you, you satisfy this so-called who criterion, okay? And, 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 you, um, and, and the primordial black hole will, will, will form. But also, um, for smaller delta, okay, it's known from uh, numerical GR simulations that um, in the inflationary scenario, we're also in radiation dominated. You don't need to go all the way to delta is one already below smaller contrast densities will form primordial black holes, okay? So it does not depend on what kind of inflationary scenario you have. I mean, you could have a complicated, you know, inflationary potential or something. I'll, I'll turn, uh, just give me one more slide and then I'll discuss a bit more, yeah, okay. Okay, but here, what we did here is we just assumed 0.45 because that's what everybody else was doing and uh, we wanted to uh, compare to their results as well, okay? So then uh, we use this to, um, to calculate the PBH formation probability. And the formation probability is related to the probability of keeping, you know, keeping a large enough patch uh, bubble-free for long enough, okay? So what you want is the patch not to have any bubbles. And also later on, as the patch is evolving, that no external bubbles intrude into the patch either. So you need to keep a, some super horizon size Hubble patch bubble-free for long enough, okay? And uh, typically, um, what one thing what one can do is uh, use this uh, monochromatic uh, PBH mass approximation, where the mass of the PBH is then, once you reach this uh, threshold, the, the mass in the, of the PBH then um, um, is set by the um, mass inside the sound horizon. Okay. Is there some uh, question? No. <laughs> Good. Okay. So now... Um, Turning back to comparing to the inflationary scenario, because this is where the numerical simulations in GR have been done, okay, assuming spherical symmetry and so on. Okay? So what, what's known there is that um, for these sort of um, overdensities, the um, PBH mass depends on some efficiency, order one efficiency factor, let's say, the mass inside the horizon, and then you have this critical collapse um, uh, phenomenon where the overdensity minus some critical value to some power that's going to set the PBH mass, okay? So, um, and crucially, okay, what these numerical studies have shown is that this, in the, in the inflationary scenario, this critical collapse threshold depends on the shape of the perturbation, okay? And this, and then the shape is, is captured by the so-called um, um, second derivative of what's, the, what's known as the compaction function at, at its maximum, okay? And then it doesn't matter what, what uh, physical shape you put in your simulation, as long as this is the same, then you get the same uh, delta C in, in radiation domination, okay? And you can see here the values typically span 0.4 to two, two thirds, okay? okay. But the, the, the issue here is the phase transition has different initial conditions, right? So basically in the inflationary scenario, you have this mode, which is super going up to super horizon sizes, and then it re-enters into in, 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 uh, in, uh, radiation domination. It's this growing mode and everything is homogeneous and so on and, and, and your approximations work so you can do the numerical simulation. Well, after the phase transition, you have this scalar field which has just collided and is decaying into radiation and it's basically a, a very messy uh, picture, right? So you have this overdensity, but uh, it has uh, smaller fluctuations and so on as well. Um, so this means that uh, there's uh, certainly a large uncertainty in this uh, critical collapse threshold in the, in the phase transition um, scenario. And people have looked at using the critical threshold of one, which is uh, motivated by the Hoop conjecture or Schwarzschild conjecture, um, which was looked at this um, paper here. And the collapse criterion was criticized in um, um, uh, this paper by uh, my colleague at uh, ENS and Zenko and Sasaki recently which also emphasized the need for curvature perturbations, of course, rather than nicer curvature perturbations. And 
in this uh, late patch mechanism, actually, the curvature perturbations, the super horizon size curvature perturbations have also been calculated in a number of papers. But uh, um, depending on the method used, they all use different methods and the results currently disagree. So it's a bit, it's an open question. People want to look at this in more detail and understand why they, these results are, uh, disagree. Okay. So, um, but what one can do also, okay, um, I'm going to go back to the monochromatic approximation soon, but just to test it, if you just assume that even in the in the phase transition scenario, you have this sort of critical collapse picture, what happens, right? If you, you've calculated the probability of, of, of getting these over densities, let's say the uh, probability density, um, what happens when you put in the just the full, simplest formula for the critical collapse during radiation domination, and you see you get these typically very uh, peaked uh, spectra, yeah, which can, uh, um, uh, the peak is well approximated, let's say by this uh, sound horizon and, um, and, and you, you can easily avoid the, the observational constraints, okay? But now for the rest, this gives a, this should show that the monochromatic approximation is, is good enough for us. So then uh, we turn now to the details of the primordial black holes as dark matter. So basically then what, what we did is just uh, um, numerically found what gauge coupling is required as a function of the VEV to get FPBH equals one. So this is for the, um, for the masses um, in the asteroid size, in the asteroid mass window. And um, okay, and then later on we're gonna use, this tells you then what the um, phase transition parameters, what uh, phase transition parameters are required and then we're going to use those to estimate omega GW, okay? But first of all, let me just, uh, okay, do it. One crucial point is that the um, bubble size of percolation is the crucial input to omega GW, and typically uh, people use this approximation for the bubble radius at, at percolation, but what one can do is actually calculate the um, distribution of bubbles themselves in the phase transition for both the background and, and late patches, so this is shown on the top left plot here. And basically the, um, um, for, for visual, visualization purposes here, um, weighted by R cubed, okay? And um, on the right, we show that um, the, the approximate uh, formula works well for these uh, close to conformal potentials. And um, some authors have uh, advocated instead of using the, um, mean bubble radius for the gravitational wave signal instead using the so-called R max, which is where the, um, the bubble, the most energy, the bubbles um, uh, carrying the most energy basically uh, are residing, which is at, at basically the maximum here of this function, of this distribution weighted by R cube. This is where the most of the volume, um, most of the energy is in, in, in those large bubbles. Okay, but uh, to remain uh, uh, conservative, we just take this uh, R approx as our, to, to, to compute our signal. Then uh, here we also check that in this scenario that the bubbles actually run away until collision so that all the energy density in the vacuum is going into the bubbles rather into, than into uh, um, excitations of the plasma. So to do that, we looked at the leading order uh, pressure on the bubble wall as particles enter the bubble or get mass and also the next leading order pressure, which uh, grows as the gamma factor of the wall, and therefore can give you a dominant contribution for these uh, supercooled uh, phase transitions, okay? And this uh, uh, next leading order pressure um, has this behavior basically because of uh, soft gauge boson production in the wall frame um, when you have a uh, broken uh, gauge symmetry, okay? So, okay, so basically these pressures are smaller than the vacuum pressure uh, pushing the bubble, so they, these will just accelerate into a collision, which means that the um, bubble collision itself is, is thought to be appropriate, they, you know, give you the dominant gravitational wave signal rather than the motions of the plasma. Okay. And what is TP? Uh, TP is the percolation temperature. Yeah. This is just the temperature when the bubbles are, when most of the volume of the, of the bubble is being converted. It doesn't matter if you put TP or TN. Uh, but the log can be large, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, oh, I see, but it's still next to leading orders. So it's smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, 
Okay, then finally here, I just show the decay rate of the of the quanta, which captures also the decay rate of these uh, scalar field oscillations following the phase transition. And basically, in this in this very minimal model, um, what helps us is that instead of decaying into um, Higgs boson pairs due to the cross quartic coupling in the in the potential, this this um, scalar field can decay into right-handed neutrinos due to the even with uh, relatively small um, Yukata couplings, so this thing can uh, decay rapidly. And then these neutrinos, like uh, you can imagine in type 1 C, uh, some type 1 C source, something, if you're in a strong washout regime, these uh, right-handed neutrinos can also decay rapidly into, into standard model particles, okay? So basically this assumption, basically I've been making throughout that the reheating is, is rapid, is, is valid in this, in this model, okay? Okay, then finally, um, Turning to the possibility of baryogenesis um, in, these, in these sort of models, basically because you have this large reheating effect, you're going to um, kill your bary you know, baryon asymmetry produced from the plasma during the phase transition or beforehand. So basically, you need all, all this means is you need the baryogenesis to take place sometime after the phase transition. And here, the natural possibility is resonant lepogenesis. Okay, so. Having said all these caveats, now let's turn to the gravitational waves. So basically, these um, show two um, phase transitions, which uh, um, um, give either um, very light primordial black holes or more towards the heavier allowed range. And the blue is the the blue curves are the those um, giving you. Uh, I mean, the blue curves are the estimates of the gravitational waves from the bubble collisions. The green are various projections for astrophysical foregrounds, and the red are um, the future experiments such as LISA, Beta, SIGO, Einstein telescope, the projection for LIGO 05 and the current limit for LIGO 03, okay? And you can see um, we've used uh, three different estimates for the um, phase transition signal. One is a full-blown uh, 3 plus 1D lattice simulation of the, of the scalar field, which is very computationally expensive and has a limited uh, uh, range of uh, uh, frequency, but um, sort of state-of-the-art. Then um, he, uh, people have looked at hybrid simulations, which also allow the inclusion of the gauge field. How these work is that first only uh, the collision of two bubbles is simulated, and this is then, this is the result, the energy scaling of this, how the um, stress energy tends tensor behaves up from this collision is then projected onto a full uh, 3D simulation where the 3 plus 1D simulation where the bubble um, collisions are, are treated in a much simplified way compared to the full lattice simulation. And finally, um, uh, there's also, people have also developed this uh, semi-analytic bulk flow model, um, which allows the, the spectrum to be um, um, uh, returned through uh, uh, a, a series of uh, clever tricks plus a computation on a desktop computer, simple simulation on a desktop computer. Okay, and what you can see, um, encouragingly enough, is that they all return similar estimates. Okay, and they're detectable. The signal is detectable about astro foregrounds. Okay, here on the left, I just show the um, peak frequency as a function of the PBH mass, and on the right, the signal to noise ratio of, of the signal above astrophysical foregrounds or experiments such as uh, LISA, Einstein telescope, and beta SIGO. And you can see with a combination, say, of a LISA and Einstein telescope, you could um, um, cover the entire mass range, okay? But the foreground has large uncertainty. Yes, that's correct. So if we turn back to the foreground, um, you can see, there, for example, at low frequencies, um, one of the dominant foregrounds is uh, galactic binary white dwarfs. And you can see here we've used uh, two different estimates, one here um, with a peak at lower frequencies and an older one with a peak at higher frequencies, and they're completely different. Right? So we just uh, used both of them, just that uh, of course the uncertainties are large. Yeah? Okay. While the um, binary neutron stars and binary black holes, of course, at low frequencies, there'll be some uncertainty, but this is really driven by the observations at, at uh, LIGO already, yeah? the sort of population that you expect. Okay, so now, um, okay, everything looks very nice, but now let me give them a few more caveats. So in, in this plot here, I show uh, um, the result from the full um, uh, 3 plus 1D hydro, uh, sorry, 3 plus 1D uh, simulation and the comparison to the so-called bulk flow model. 
So basically for these close to scalar, uh, close to conformal potentials, you want to look at this orange curve here at the bottom, which is um, most closely mim mimicking those potentials. And you can see that um, with the many, like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of <laughs> CPU hours, they can um, um, give you some information on, on the, about an order of magnitude and in, in frequency or so. Yeah. Um, and what, what it shows is that um, at high frequencies, um, the bulk flow model here, this um, long dashed and short dotted, dash dotted line here, that the, um, in this, uh, for these so-called uh, thick walls bubbles, which is mimicking this uh, close to conformal potential, that the, um, the, the frequency scales basically roughly as F to the minus two, rather than um, what's known as the envelope approximation where the frequency would be like a one on one on F like high frequencies. Okay. Okay. So there's also in the, in the simulations, there's also the second peak here, but this is known to be uh, unphysical suppressed just due to the limited resolution of the, of the simulation. Okay. So the question then is, you know, this matches this uh, bulk flow model, but um, it, it uh, it's limited in its resolution. So you might think maybe the bulk flow model itself is not, no longer valid at small scales. So then, and the simulation isn't ca capturing that. So to explain a bit more, this is illustrates, this, this picture here illustrates the difference between the envelope approximation and the bulk flow model. So in the envelope approximation, basically um, in this calculation of the gravitational wave signal from the bubble collisions, basically collided sections of the wall are just uh, deleted and removed from the, from the calculation. While in the bulk flow model, um, scalar field uh, or, or um, excited plasma um, is allowed to propagate further after the after the collision. Okay, um, and then because you in the bulk flow model you don't have these um, uh, sharp uh, kinks here where the uh, field has been deleted, then you um, you understand why the high frequency tail is is is, is suppressed in the bulk. So is the resolution? Sorry, is the resolution uh, just because of the finite lattice size? Yeah, yeah, because you have you have vastly different scales. One is the bubble wall thickness, yeah. and the other is the Hubble scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can't set, you know, make the separation like you would in, in real life. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this could be looked at you know, possibly in, in thought about in more detail. And then second of all, in these very strong phase transitions. The universe is, you know, the expansion of the universe is also would be important during the phase transition itself. So while these bubbles are expanding, they're also redshifting like radiation, and this will tend to weaken the signal. And actually, this was shown, this, this effect was shown using the envelope approximation and for uh, radiation-dominated phase transitions in this, in this paper here. And you can see here, this, this parameter sigma is just the basically beta on H, okay? You can see here when beta on H is 10, basically they have an order of, okay, the, the, the line at the top is just the, the signal you'd expect in, um, if you just have a, if you don't have an expanding space time, right? Well, when they take into account the expanding space time during the phase transition itself, when the phase transition approaches um, a tenth of the Hubble time, you have an order of magnitude compression <laughs> in the signal, okay? So this needs to be looked at also in the in the case of the bulk flow model and assuming vacuum domination. Okay. So there are another number of open questions. Okay, um, there's some uncertainty in the there's some disagreement in the in the calculation of the power spectrum of the curvature perturbations on super horizon modes in, in these in these in these uh, late patch mechanisms, and this is needed to in order to understand the second order gravitational waves from I mean, from subcritical patches, okay? Which will also add to the gravitational wave signal. Um, also, the large degree of supercooling, we want to use eventually, uh, of course, RGE improved effective potentials or dimensionally reduced effective potentials uh, for, for our calculations in terms of uh, specific models of, of the phase transition. And um, as you pointed out before, this um, it's not yet clear how well we can distinguish omega GW from different PBH formation mechanisms. So for the example, the um, inflationary scenario, um, we have the second order gravitational waves and the, and the phase transition scenario, we have the bubble collisions and the second order gravitational waves. Okay. And as I, and also <laughs> you foreshadowed before, um, the, 
the strong signal does not um, prove FPBH equals one, okay? Um, because it's very sensitive to beta of H, but okay, first of all, a large, large omega GW would be welcome, like we're seeing from pulsar timing arrays at, at lower frequencies. And also then there are other ways of uh, searching for the primordial black holes, say, um, um, uh, lensing of uh, X-ray pulsars, uh, 21 centimeter cosmology and so on. So people have ideas of how to test this um, um, gap uh, using other methods, right? So that will hopefully give you some uh, confirmation. So I'll just uh, um, leave my conclusion here that this is a very uh, promising way of getting indirect evidence of uh, PBH dark matter or, or ruling it out from the late patch mechanism. So thanks. Can I ask a question? So, 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 so I think it may be best for someone in the room to um, moderate the questions because I don't see the room, actually. Uh, but, but maybe I can ask a question. So, so is there, um, or can you construct a smoking gun signal by measuring both primordial black holes via lensing and phase transitions? Would that be possible? That would really point to that? Or, yeah, or is it just the sensitivity is not high enough? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think lensing, well, what kind of lensing in asteroid mass? Ah, okay, there was uh, recently a paper on the uh, uh, lensing of X-ray pulsars, uh, possibility, I don't know how solid it is, it's just a preprint I saw, um, yeah, so you need a smaller object, right, rather than the star itself, and you need a smaller wavelength, rather than yeah, uh, uh, lensing of stars. But the pulsar gives off uh, more power in X-rays, and it's also yeah higher frequency. Yeah. You're sensitive to asteroid mass. Right? There was a it's not published yet, but there was a paper recently which uh, uh, they said they said they okay making some they, optimistic assumptions that they think uh, could be done with a dedicated mission, in relatively short mm -hmm. time. So I mean there are of course other possibilities, yeah. I don't have the whole list, though. Is anyone else in the room? Um, is there anyone else in the room who would like to ask a question? Anyone online would like to ask a question? I had a question. Okay. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, you said something about your simulations and how um, <clears throat> you're not taking into account the expansion of the universe. Yeah. During, I mean, so. <coughs> so how, I mean, are they like on co moving coordinates or something? Uh, so no, no, no. What what they do? Okay, okay. And I should say these, these in that case. What, basically, what these simulations do. I mean, what these calculations do. Is yeah. They 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 aim to give you the. Uh, the signal, you know, the expected signal yeah. in terms of um, in terms of the macroscopic parameters of the phase mm -hmm. transition. So this alpha, the, the latent heat, and the yeah. and the time scale of the phase transition. Okay, and um, basically, as you can, okay, and um, they, yeah, they they're not working in an ex expanding uh, space time. So yeah. during, of course, after the phase transition, after the signal's been generated, the redshifting is it has to be taken into account because it's right. a large effect. But uh, during the phase transition itself, they're not uh, taking into account that when this bubble is expanding, but also... I think, I think this is a scale. This is this classic paper by Paul Colbert Turner, because I remember that when we were writing okay, okay. about this... Yeah, yeah. Paper, yeah, yeah. It would have the same problem, which okay. is numerical implementation. Okay, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was quite significant. Okay. Oh, you think it's... Okay, I have to look it up then. But, well, the yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's in common uh, Turner, there is a classic paper. So we went back to that paper and just removed the approximation. Okay. Well, you just have to rewrite, the just do your lapses on in co moving coordinates or something. And then you were just oh, actually it's, have, it's no, very it, complicated. It's hard to, uh, to, to do this analytically. Or, uh, so they usually, usually the nucleation and then the. But you're doing a lot of lapses on, I mean, you're doing it numerically, right? You said. But the. the well. Your equations of motion will look a bit different. Um, and so, so the uh, no, no. Usually, usually the effects are small yeah. if you have a normal. If you have, you know, have a 
substantial right. sugar pool. Okay. Uh, and so the people ignored for, for a long time. And all this, at that time, all these softwares they were ignoring, which is final form of, of the approximation. But yeah, you need to take this into account. Right. This another thing that I've quite, never quite understood in some of these. I mean, normally if you think that there's a, you know, at least it depends on the time, time in which the nucleation is, time scale in which. I mean, normally if you have a bubble that's expanding, that's expanding at that rate, you expect you expect a back reaction on the expanding universe itself. Yes. And well, that, that you can't do. That's, that, that's never taken into account. That's impossible. And I don't know how <laughs> significant that back reaction would be. Well, in, in their case, no. But in our case, when we're discussing, it was significant. Uh, yeah, because the number of production of the bubble were much yes, faster. Yes, so, so that, that's than, that's than the vacuum domination, yeah, I mean, for so, example. And we were just arguing, you know, it's hard to compute this. It's, thing. it's very hard to compute. You you, you don't even know whether the uh, vacuum domination happens at mm -hmm. that point right. yeah. because of the inhomogeneity produced yeah. by bubbles. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So very yeah. But yeah. not not in his case. I mean, in his case, it's very very low. Yeah, initially, yeah, when, when it first enters back on the nation, it's very low for. Yeah, so that, that would be uh, significant. Yeah, I know your paper by uh, with uh, Adrian. Yeah. In that case, of course, the production of bubbles was much faster, and, uh, and so you had really heavily homogeneous. Okay, I see. Around, and so the inflation. Yeah, even, I mean, it's just an estimation. Okay, I see. I want to take this. Uh, Yeah, I remember. This is how you end up with a low, yeah, low reheating temperature and the low frequency. Yeah, you, you don't have that heat. Yeah, in the PTA yeah. and yeah, exactly. Quite sensitive to those things. Any other question from online? Someone online? I don't even know who's online. <laughs> no. But the conceptually, just just as a remark, I mean, so the conceptually, if you're talking about the scale invariant models, yes. so, uh, you know, uh, we had those models, so we, we worked on the scale invariant things, but there is a way of canceling the cosmological constant without introducing the explicit cosmological okay. constant. So in that case, uh, the situation is completely different. You know, you, uh, in that case, I mean, uh, if you have a, just a minimal model uh, with a nonlinear realized yes. scale of okay. you need a deal of field that's, it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all you need. And in that case, you you may not be able to complete the phase transition at all, okay. unless the QCD helps. Ah, okay, okay. In that case, so there is no way. So because the, because those two minima are almost the general. Okay, I see. Until QCD breaks. Yeah, okay. the QCD drives the electrolytic phase transition. Yeah. Of course, yeah. When if QCD drives the transition, then the bubble sizes could be much smaller. Oh yeah, and yeah. then you yeah. might not have such a strong gravitational waves. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, it's it's it is. Uh, the QCD phase transition that comes with the six flavors. Yeah. All, all the yeah. quarks are massless. Yeah. So, so it can be first order. Yeah. It's a first order. Yeah. In that case, yeah. It's hard to model, but. Questions, comments? So what, what is the time scale of this new experiment? Can you remind us, uh, this LISA and so on? Yeah, okay, so LISA is like... 2040? Yeah, yeah, okay, I mean, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, I mean, the, the sort of typical launch date you're hearing were like 2035 or so on, like this. Okay. Optimistic. Yeah, it depends on how much money they're given, right? And, and so on, and when they're given the money. But then, yeah, and then the... Then the then to do, okay, after one year, you'd already have, I mean, here, uh, here this curve is for, if I remember correctly, it's one year, okay, it scales as uh, the square root of the observation time, yeah, the, the sensitivity. So typical observation times and then like four years or something like this. Has it been formally approved? I think it's got, yeah, yeah. last finder, right? So yeah, 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 but it's, it's being driven by, yeah, ESA, yeah, they're, yeah. they're continuing, yeah. So, so there's not going to be shelved. No, 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 it doesn't seem no, like because I mean, sure. like, I keep hearing the dates and they keep pushing you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I keep hearing the dates and because I had heard 2032, 2033, yeah. then 2036, seven now, pushing yeah. towards 2040. So, yeah. <laughs> and Einstein telescope is, is sort of a similar time frame, yeah. You're at like 2038, something like this. Yeah. This also has a lot of uh, uh, funding and, and, you know, push like the, they, the R&D. The they'll come before the next colliders. The, the, the Einstein telescope yeah. pathfinder and so on to test some technologies. And so on. Yeah, I mean, they haven't decided on the location yet. Yeah, yeah. But, but the funding is secure, but just not the location. Okay, okay. The, no, it's a question. Okay. okay. I, I don't think the location is fixed yet, though. Between the, um, let's say, the uh, yeah, Belgian uh, site, the yeah, Maastricht, Aachen, and the, and the uh, Sardinia. But it will definitely happen. Like, uh, it's just that they haven't, so they have, they have oh. the cure to fund. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, definitely yeah. happen until the thing is uh, yeah. up and running. <laughs> then, uh, if there are no further questions, then uh, we'll close the uh, formal part of the 